17 people killed in a mass shooting at a Florida high school. I say people, most of them kids, high school kids. We're learning more tonight about the 19-year-old suspect's weapons and about clues from his social media. Scene in Crime and Justice reporter Shimon Prokopaz joins me now uh, with more. Hey, Shimon, uh, thank you so hey, much Dr. for joining us. Sure. You know, breaking news tonight is about what happened. I understand you have some new news tonight on the shooter's background check. What can you tell us? That's right. A lot of questions throughout the day about this weapon, the AR-15 style rifle that he used in the shooting. Uh, we're, we're now learning from U.S. officials who have been briefed on this investigation that the shooter purchased the firearm. They now have information. The ATF has been tracing this firearm. And what we're being told by U.S. officials is that he purchased this himself. He went into a gun store and was able to purchase this AR-15 on his own. Uh, we believe that it's been done in the, it was done in the past year. And key here is that he passed the background check. Now, Don, what's interesting here is because he's 19, and so if he purchased this a year ago, let's say he was 18, that's perfectly legal. You can purchase this style of weapon at a firearm store at his age. What you can't purchase is a handgun because you have to be 21 to purchase a handgun. So it's kind of an interesting piece of detail here that there is nothing essentially preventing him from purchasing this weapon. So <laughs> you have to be 21 to purchase a handgun, but only 18 for an ass assault style weapon. That's the federal law. Essentially, there was nothing uh, preventing him, uh, not his age, nothing in his background uh, from purchasing this. That is, that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, do we know anything about search warrants? Shimon, yeah. I'm hearing there's new information about that. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, the local police there, along with the FBI and the ATF, all working together here. Uh, we know of at least two search warrants uh, that, were, that are being executed, that are police and the FBI and ATF are in the process. Uh, one of them, we believe, is his home. Uh, and then there's another location. We're not sure what the other location is. But at this point, you know, it's usually expected in these types of situations. They go to the homes, they grab the computers, whatever else, to look at, just sort of get a sense of what he was doing at home, his computers, go through his mm -hmm. computers. So what you would normally see in these types of situations is going on right now. And this is going to be work that's going to go on through the night. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, he's supposed to be in court. So police will certainly learn a lot about him through the night. Okay, so he's supposed to be in court in the morning. And, and, and then talk to me more about some, uh, some information on his social media posts again, Shimon. Yeah, so these are some of his Instagram posts. And we heard the sheriff there all day in, in his press conference raise issues with the social media, his background, uh, the, uh, their background check of him. And what they were able to find was really disturbing items on his social media pages, the items about guns, uh, different things he talked about, killing law enforcement, uh, and really concerning to them and wondering, the police there wondering, why is it that when he expressed the words he used about killing, uh, the pictures that he used of the weapons, why is it that no one went to police to report this? He certainly right now was not on the police, on the radar of the police, but certainly when you look at the type of items he was posting, open for anyone to see on Instagram, it raises a lot of questions for police as to why no one reported him. And the sheriff sort of stressed this tonight. He, in his last press conference of the evening, he said, you know, if you, this whole idea of you see something, say something. And he kept talking about that because time and time again in these types of situations, we do hear this where someone sees something, they just think, hey, you know what, I'm going to ignore it. It doesn't seem like a big deal. But in the end, it turns out to be a big deal. And, you know, if you listen to the sheriff tonight, it just seemed like he was concerned that there were some missed opportunities here uh, in trying to prevent this because no one, no one alerted the police about him. Mm -hmm. Shimon, thank you very much. Getting more information, please come back and report it to us. Uh, I want to bring in now CNN contributor um, Wesley Lauer. He's a national reporter for The Washington Post. Chris Wecker is a former FBI assistant director of the Criminal Investigative Division. Chris, you just heard the news. Uh, to me, it floors me. And listen, I don't know everything. I sit here, I don't know everything about gun laws. I don't know everything about weapons. But what I do have is common sense. So you can get a handgun at 21 years old, right? But at 18, you can buy an assault-style weapon. You can't buy a handgun when you're 18. What is the sense? Can you please? I'm, I really want to know this, and I don't mean to be facetious about this. What is the logic behind that? How does that make sense? I don't know the logic behind it, but actually in Florida, if you're 18, you can get either. 
So Florida has one of the most uh, liberal gun laws in the country. It, if that, you look at so the, that's not a I've federal said this before, regulation, if you look at that's the, by state? Right, correct. Now, if you look at the uh, website of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the largest police organization in the country, the major city, city chiefs uh, association, all the major law enforcement associations, they've come out against these assault weapons, especially these AR-15s, for years and years. And during the time that they, that they were controlled or banned, uh, violent gun crime went down 66%. So the assault weapons are, are the... They're not the only issue here. There's many other issues involved, but, but they are one of the issues here. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, once again, we see these images of young children running out of their school, hands above their heads, law enforcement, they, the swamps at a mass shooting scene. You can see them all there standing. Look at that. Look at the scene. We have seen these scenes, these images before. What will investigators be looking for at, at a crime scene here? Well... There, 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 there are a lot of things going on right now. The, the FBI's evidence response team is looking very hard at the crime scene, his movements, tracking his movements uh, from start to finish. What's more important, though, is, is you talked about the, the, the sort of the early warning system, the see something, say something. This kid was flashing red. There were neon signs over his left shoulder from his social media posts, uh, he was he was about to go off, and I, I've seen his social media posts from two years ago, and he's posing with weapons, he's posing with knives, he's making threats. 219 followers. That's 219 chances that someone could have picked up the phone and made a phone call. This is mo the most egregious example of nobody picking up the phone and making that call, whether it's a teacher, a parent, or somebody that saw his posts on the internet. But this kid was flashing red. Yeah. yeah. We keep asking, you know, what were signs missed or, you know, if there was anything you can do. I mean, we've done this with every single shooting that I've been here. And I've been sitting you know, on this anchor desk we're sitting in for 12 years now, almost 13 years. Do we ever really find, does it ever make sense? Do we ever find out what the issue is beyond the one common denominator here, which is you know what? And one common denominator is, that for is me, guns. Don? Yeah, I'm talking. That's for you. Yeah, I mean, there are always lessons learned. There, there have been many, many things that have changed over the years, but mainly in the area of trying to prevent these incidents from a school security standpoint, from law enforcement response aspects. I do school security assessments. I make, uh, you know, I'm up on the, mo the most recent security techniques, the things that that will work or have the best chance of working. You know, it's a combination of things, Don, but I still go back to that, uh, that first line of defense, which is the people that are, can observe the behavior of mm -hmm. this person and, and know, you know in your heart that something bad is about to happen, but you're reluctant to pick up the phone and stigmatize per, that person right. and draw, draw, their, uh, draw law enforcement attention to them because you're afraid that it, maybe you're wrong. Yeah. Well, the stigma is not whether someone has um, a, a mental issue a mental health issue, that's not the stigma. I think the issue is, is allowing those people, or that kind of person to have access to a weapon, right. especially an assault style weapon. Wes Lowry, you've been sitting by patiently here. You heard the new information. Um, he was able he, to legally buy an assault style weapon at 18. Uh, perhaps that uh, he wouldn't have been able to do that with a handgun, but I'm hearing from Chris Wecker, at 18 you can do both in the state of Florida, legally. Sure, and, and I think that that, you know, each of these shootings, and, you know, Don, you've been talking about the years you've been here at CNN uh, covering these. My entire career has been going from one of these shootings to the next of these shootings. It feels like it's one of the only constant things each year is that we're going to find ourselves here having this conversation. We were here in Vegas and in Sutherland Springs and in Sh Charleston, right? And, and the list goes on, and it seems almost endless going back to Columbine. And the details are different in each of these cases, right? So, so in this specific case, it does seem, based on what we know so far, that there were some clear and obvious warning signs of who this person uh, was and perhaps that he might uh, have been someone who was a risk. You think of other cases, Stephen Paddock in Vegas, who, who we still don't really have any explanation of why he had done this. And, and it seems, based on what we know, that it might have been difficult for someone to have spotted him beforehand. You know, you've been kind of getting at it um, through this conversation that there are clear, a clear common denominator here 
uh, certainly some element of mental illness, but also uh, the access to these weapons, right? That we are the only country where this is routinely happening this way, where our children are being slaughtered as they sit in their high schools and their elementary schools, where we um, know that, a, that our Valentine's Day might be interrupted in the middle of the afternoon as cell phone video burst into our phones of children and their hands trembling as they, as they hear gunshots in their high mm -hmm. school hallways, right? This is something that, you know, we, we run the risk of becoming desensitized to, but frankly, that we're all traumatized by, that we've been going through decades of this, that every few months, we know we're going to be confronted with this trauma and with this terror that, frankly, a lot of our brothers and sisters across the world do not have to worry about walking into a church, walking into a synagogue or a mosque or a high school or an elementary school and being gunned down this way.